And with that, uh, welcome Neil Carragher. Uh, he's, uh, as I said, from the University of Edinburgh. Um, he uh, studied in Oxford, uh, did a uh, postdoctoral uh, research in Seattle and in Glasgow, uh, spent some time in the industry uh, with uh, AstraZeneca from 2004 to 2010. And since 2010 is in his uh, uh, current position, where he's working uh, a lot on uh, high content and, and phenotypic screens. So thanks a lot, Neil, for joining. Okay, so uh, thank you, Andreas, and thank you both Andreas and Lorenz for the invitation to talk at this session. So about three years ago now, we set up something in Edinburgh, which we call the Edinburgh Cancer Discovery Unit. And um, this is really a collaboration between the University of Edinburgh NHS Lothian, which is our local health care provider, and Cancer Research UK, who fund the Edinburgh Cancer Research Centre, where our unit is based. And the motivation between, by, behind establishing this unit is that we wanted to drive innovations that promote a more evidence-led approach to target validation and phenotypic-led drug discovery in more relevant model systems. As the title suggests, the main approaches and techniques we use are high content analysis, intravital in vivo imaging, and reverse phase protein microarray technology. So what I'd like to do in this talk is, um, uh, first of all, introduce you to our unit and share a little bit of our drug discovery philosophy and really describe where we think as academics we can best contribute to the drug discovery process. I'm then going to run through the technologies and I'll describe how we're using new high content models in combination with toolkit compounds to explore uh, the biology of targets. I'll specifically describe uh, novel model systems which we hope uh, better represent the mechanisms of human disease uh, rather than uh, some of the previous models that have been used historically in phenotypic screens or acid development. I'll speak about our intravital in vivo imaging technology. This is high resolution in imaging in live animal models. And I'm also going to briefly mention our reverse phase protein microarray platform. This allows us to quantify changes at the post-translational pathway level following target perturbation or compound exposure in both our in vitro and in vivo models. And then at the end, I'm going to describe how we bring all these things together to drive new drug discovery models. And I'm going to speak for the first time that we spoke about this is our uh, cooperative ligand-based phenotypic screening strategy that brings all these techniques together. So first of all, to our unit, this is uh, where we're based. This is the Edinburgh Cancer Research Centre building. Um, we are also part of a wider institute of genetics and molecular medicine, and they've just built this big extension onto the cancer building. We like to think it's an extension to cancer, but really there's 500 researchers here working across different disease areas. There's a lot of expertise in genetic engineering and bioinformatics, and that really helps support our target validation and translational studies. The best thing about working here is we're on a hospital campus. So right behind the Cancer Research Building, we have the oncology clinic. So we have great access to clinical samples and also great access to clinical insight on a daily basis, which is very valuable for our projects. Also on campus, we have something called the Wellcome Trust Clinical Research Facility. They're experts in genetics, genomics and statistics. They run clinical trials, which is also very helpful. And that allows us to concentrate on our core capabilities in the unit, which is really imaging and proteomics. We have a number of high content imaging platforms. Our workhorse is the Image Express Micro. Uh, we have a number of multi-photon and confocal systems that are modified for in vivo imaging. And we have uh, proteomics, we've got a mass spec. And we have two protein microarray platforms. We have a Zeptosin's reverse phase protein array, one of the few uh, in academia. And we also have another protein microarray platform. It's a bit more flexible based on ocean printing technology. So in this slide, I've really tried to describe um, basically a little bit where, uh, how we think we can complement conventional drug discovery. And up at the top here, I have the well-known target-directed project operating model. I'm sure we'd all agree that when this works, it works beautifully. The only problem is it doesn't work that often. We see high attrition rates in late stage uh, development due to uh, poor efficacy. Um, so we really need better validated targets to increase the success rates. But I also think we need to be a wee bit smarter in how we use these preclinical models. Quite often we see, certainly in, in oncology, when we take our models, uh, our compounds into in vivo, and we don't see the efficacy thresholds we want, two things can happen. 
You can either just kill the project and start again at the beginning on another target and spend more money. Or we are somewhat selective and we pick, we pick the PDX model, the Xenograph model that gave us maximum response. For me, I still don't think we really explore enough uh, the models where we see suboptimal activity. And I think that's a pity because I think the most informative model is the one where the drug doesn't work. If we can understand how complex biological systems subvert targeted therapy, we may get a better insight on how to use these targeted therapies in the clinic. So for us, we think there's a knowledge gap in how understanding target and compound mechanism and really complex pathophysiological models of disease. And because of that lack of knowledge and iterative learning, a lot of our biomarker and combination strategies are really coming from target hypothesis, often taken from the literature and often context dependent. So our approach is much more empirical. We've kind of coined this term high definition profiling. Um, and in the case of a compound, what we do is uh, we will uh, test it in detail at the phenotypic level, the pharmacokinetic level, and at the pathway level, particularly at the post-translational pathway level. So this is almost like a, a high-definition phenotypic approach. And for target validation, we do exactly the same thing. Uh, we use the same technologies, and we'll probe our target activity across phenotypic functional assays. Uh, we'll uh, use FRET biosensors to look at the temporal and spatial activation of the target in live and uh, in vitro and in vivo models. And we'll again look at what the consequences of inhibiting the target on the post-translational pathway network. Now, we want to apply these technologies to the best models that we can, but we're not so naive to think that we can recapitulate a patient uh, in, a, in a test tube. But we do think we can recapitulate certain aspects of disease pathophysiology, and I'll give some examples of that. We also particularly like models of uh, sensitivity and resistance. When we apply these tools to such models where the compound works and it doesn't, we really get a true understanding of the compound mechanism of action and more insight into the target. And now we can build our biomarker and combination strategies based on this empirical evidence rather than target hypothesis. So how we actually do this then is described in the next slide. We focus on three core areas. And um, the first one in the top left there is our high content assays. Uh, over here we do the in vivo imaging. And then the bottom left is our omics strategy, which is reverse phase protein uh, array. So our strength really in an academic and a clinical environment is biology. So we don't want to recapitulate the high throughput screens that's going on in industry. Industry has got great infrastructure and high content imaging. We really want assays that have a bit of a twist, uh, assays that give us a little bit of a novel mechanistic insight into disease. And I'll show a couple of examples of those. We have a number of uh, tumour models in the centre. We've got the PDX models, xenograft models, and transgenic models. But we don't actually get a lot of mechanistic information from these models uh, when we measure tumour volume or standard endpoints. So we use these tissue window devices in parallel with fluorescent reporters and uh, transgenic mice. And we can image tumours at the subcellular and cellular resolution. And we can look at more pathophysiological features. And I'll show a couple of examples of that. And this is really almost like high content imaging in a live animal. We're often using the same probes, even the same cells from our assays in vivo. So we can use this information in vivo to calibrate the predictivity of our assays. So at least we're reducing that gap between screening assays and in vivo models. And bottom left is our omics strategy. Everyone needs an omics strategy. And in Edinburgh, we are mad about next generation sequencing like everything, everyone else. And we will literally sequence anything that moves, humans, sheep, mouse, uh, worms. We do all that uh, in the institute. But as a translational uh, biologist, I'm also interested at the protein level, particularly the activation state of proteins. And we wanted a technology that would allow us to um, robustly measure low abundant fossil epitopes. And we wanted to do it in a significant throughput that we could test targets and compounds across assays, across time points and dose points. And the technology that seemed to meet uh, as many of those requirements was reverse phase protein array. So I think each of these technologies stand on their own, but the real value is when we combine them together and apply them to informative preclinical models and even access to clinical samples. Uh, and we can get a real detailed view of target activity, can look at drug target mechanism, we can uh, anticipate resistance by putting our compounds and targets across assays and build combination strategies. And these models are great for testing combinations because we expand a lot of target space. So I'm just going to run through some examples now of uh, how we use this technology. And first of all, to the high content assays. 
So this is a particular assay looking at oncogene survival autophagy. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with autophagy. It's a very gray and complex area in cancer. It's very context dependent. It can sometimes promote uh, oncogenesis. It can sometimes inhibit uh, oncogenesis. And sometimes it depends on which paper you read as well. So what we've done here is we tried to put a bit more context in the autophagy assay. And we derived these squamous cell carcinoma cells from our mouse skin carcinogenesis model. We've isolated these skin cancer cells from normal mice and mice where we've knocked out the focal adhesion kinase protein. We have a lot of interest in this focal adhesion kinase protein in the center, so I'm going to use that protein as an exemplar of how we do target validation. Now, focal adhesion kinase is a substrate for the oncogene SARC, and we found out that when we deleted fat from these cells, the localization of SARC changed. It was in these puncta, where not in its way expected to see it in focal adhesions. We did some co-staining with LC3, and indeed these puncta are uh, autophagosomes. And what we're thinking here is this is a defense mechanism for the cell. So we know SARC promotes oncogenic transformation, and it promotes the maintain maintenance of the transformed phenotype. But if you have too much SARC oncogenic activity, the cell will detach, it will just die. So what we think is happening here is when we uncouple SARC from its uh, primary substrate FAC, the cell is trying to protect itself by removing the excess SARC activity to survive. And indeed, if we treat these cells with inhibitors such as chloroquine, these cells are more sensitized to death than the parental cells. So it's an oncogene survival assay. This is also a lovely assay for uh, screening uh, uh, autophagy because they have very high basal levels of autophagy here. So you get a nice uh, window for screening. And what we did here is we did a screen with the TOCRIS screen, kinase inhibitor toolbox, to really get an idea of what pathways and targets are uh, regulating this oncogene survival autophagy assay. And we've seen a good couple of candidates that reverted the phenotype uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this phenomenon. And so this assay allows us to classify compounds. Um, we can classify compounds that promote oncogene survival autophagy, compounds that inhibit oncogene survival autophagy, compounds that promote the basal autophagy and inhibit basal autophagy. And almost our holy grail was a compound that inhibits oncogene survival autophagy, but not basal autophagy. We know then we can target oncogenic survival, but not have all the liabilities associated with other autophagy processes. So this is another example of a very simple high-content assay, cell cycle assay. It's been around for many years, but here we've applied it to a particular clinical scenario. And the scenario is ovarian cancer, and resistance to drugs and ovarian cancer is a huge problem. The uh, standard of care therapy for ovarian cancer is a com combination of carboplatin and paclitaxel, um, but 20% of patients don't respond uh, to the combination, and the 80% of patients that do respond, the majority will eventually relapse. So we've isolated ovarian cells from patients before and after relapse, and these cells maintain uh, their sensitivity. So before uh, treatment, they are sensitive to paclitaxel and platinum, uh, and the cells where we've taken from the patients after relapse, uh, they become more resistant. And you can probably see that in this little mitotic assay. So this is a nice little comparative uh, panel from the same patient of sensitivity and resistance. And we've got a couple of these panels now. And we want to use them to explore what are the mechanisms governing uh, resistance to the taxanes and also the carboplatin. So again, we've done a, a screen uh, with an annotated tool compensate. This is the GSK. GlaxoSmithKline published kinase inhibitor sets, about 367 kinases, and we've run a counter screen. And I'll just show a snapshot, snapshot of the data. So quite surprisingly, we found a lot of inhibitors in this uh, kinase inhibitor set. I say a lot, but seven or eight. that preferentially induce mitosis in the resistant cells and not in the sensitive cells. I'll just show you one of these um, images here. Um, now, this seems to indicate that the mitotic checkpoint of these resistant cells is modified in some way. They have different vulnerabilities and different sensitivities compared to uh, the parental cells. But also we've got a huge opportunity here for a therapeutic index in these resistant uh, cells. Now the idea behind this GSK set is uh, we, we uh, do the studies and we publish the data. But when I read the MTA yesterday, I have to give 30 days notice. So I can tell you what these targets are in 30 days. Um, also, this is the first hit, but we'll need to validate these, and we validate these by looking for structurally distinct compounds that have the same target selectivity profile of these compounds, and we do sRNA. And we've run this panel through a number of assays now, and uh, this has worked quite well for us. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about 3D ex vivo models um, uh, to look at particular um, 
elements of pathophysiology. So when speaking to the pancreatic surgeons and the ovarian oncologists, uh, they tell us that when uh, pancreatic cancer patients and ovarian cancer patients are diagnosed, the disease has already spread to the peritoneal cavity. And uh, from clinical studies, the genetics of that metastatic disease is very different from primary disease. And unfortunately, it's the metastatic disease which kills the patient. Again, talking to the clinicians, for some reason, uh, pancreatic cancer preferentially spreads to the retroperitoneal tissue and ovarian cancer spreads to the mentum tissue. Now, it's very easy to get retroperitoneal tissue and omentum tissue from the clinics from general surgery. So what we've done here is we've taken these tissues and we've used them as a scaffold to culture our cancer cell lines on. So up there, is the, these are just GFP PANC1 cells cultured in the retroperitoneal tissue scaffold. And down here, we have our red ovarian cancer cells cultured on the omentum tissue scaffold. And here we have a little cross-section, confocal cross-section. And what happens is the ovarian cells form a nice monolayer on top of the tissue and then invade into the tissue. If I play this movie, you can see the cells actually invade in between the adipocytes. So this is very reminiscent of what the pathologists see in, in the human. So we think this is a great assay for looking at what are the mechanisms around uh, dissemination uh, and survival within that metastatic niche. Um, so obviously this is not a high throughput screen. Um, no way is it a high throughput screen, but we can test hundreds of compounds. So we're very interested in tool compounds that may be coming from industry. So if Lorenz or uh, Andreas have some interesting compound sets, we'd love to test them in what is really a very important clinical endpoint. So I'm now going to move uh, quickly on to talk about the in vivo imaging work. So we have a number of these little tissue window devices for different models. We have these dorsal tissue windows for our PDX models and our Xenograph models. We've got a window that sits over the mammary fat pad for our transgenic breast cancer model. And also we and also collaborators are designing uh, abdominal windows to look at um, uh, cancer in the uh, abdominal cavity, pancreatic cancer, liver, etc. And I have to say that um, this is all regulated by the home office. These mice have to not suffer. They have to be very mobile and health healthy. The Home Office are very supportive around these studies because we do these studies under recoverable anaesthesia. So for longitudinal studies, we use very little mice. We don't need large cohorts to sacrifice at different time points. With five mice, we can do a longitudinal study. Um, so this is uh, our multi-photon confocal microscope. It's been modified to uh, uh, enhance the light that penetrates through tissue. It also has some Raman spectroscopy uh, running through the optics. It allows us to do coherent anti-Stokes Raman spectroscopy spectroscopy, which is label free imaging. Uh, the stage is modified as well. Um, so I say these mice are under recoverable anesthesia. We put them on the stage and they almost clamped on via the window. And this is really useful because the mice are breathing, but the region of interest is very static. And we need that static uh, imaging if we want to do any quantitative imaging work. Uh, we can't have the images going in and out of focus. So this is an example of uh, one of our live tumors. Uh, this tumour is expressing a uh, GFP e cotyrin on the uh, cell periphery and you can see the purple is just the natural reflections from tissue deposited by the uh, tumour cells. You can see the blood, throw, uh, blood flow through the tumour. And uh, this static image is really useful. We can do techniques such as photo bleaching and look at the stability of those cell-cell junctions. It's something we've published in the past. We have a particular interest in cell migration. Um, so, um, find my cursor again. Um, very interested in cell migration um, but when you look at these movies not a lot's happening over a 24 hour period you can see a couple of cells moving it's almost impossible to quantify anything so we have to use some tricks and here we expressed a tumour cell expressing a photo switchable GFP reporter and what we can do, do is we can shine a short pulse of UV laser through that window and basically convert GFP to RFP it's almost like painting a little region red and then we could follow the fate of those cells over time. And you can see that they're spreading. And you get a lot of qualitative data about the invasion in vivo. Um, but what's really important to us is getting quantitative data. And this is very easy to measure just by a region of interest. So here for another example using a compound against the focal adhesion kinase. It's a kinase inhibitor from Pfizer. Inhibits FAC. And you can see in this model, uh, we suppress uh, the migration of these cells. We need to prove the compound's not toxic, so we also have a photo switch we'll reporter on the nuclei. And during the course of this experiment, we need to see no difference in cell number in the region of interest. We do see the suppression of cell migration. And the message here is um, in 24 hours, we can get very quantitative data 
in vivo data on invasion with standard techniques we may have to do assays over several months and a lots of pathology. It's also possible to administer compound through the window or peptide or sRNA. Uh, so it is a, an opportunity to do some early target validation and get in vivo proof of concept uh, rapidly. I think the most in interesting thing about the in vivo imaging work is when it gives us new insight into disease pathophysiology. And here I'm showing a movie from several years ago. This came from John Condelis and Jeff Siegel's lab at the Albert Einstein. And when I play the movie, you'll see uh, tumour cells um, migrating along the collagen fibres. Um, and this really changed our view of how tumour cells invade through, through uh, cancer. Previously, we used to think they used to remodel the extracellular matrix and degrade their way through the extracellular matrix. But clearly, they're invading along these collagen fibres. And we begin to see also new, uh, new insights into pathophysiology uh, through these images as well. So this is a, a model where we have uh, GFP-labeled cancer cells put into a syngenic immunocompetent mouse. The mouse has a reporter on the macrophages. So the macrophages are red. And here you can have these panoramic images and see how the, the tumour is reacting with the stroma. And when we look at invasion, we know it's not a stochastic process. It's spatially coordinated. We see these little regions where the tumour cells are streaming out of uh, the cancer. And it's co-localising with macrophages. And this is a low-resolution view. We see this all the time. The tumour is usually encapsulated. And you almost get this little region where it looks like it's burst. And there's also some clear stromal interaction here. Um, so now we can go and look at targets, compounds, a, a specific uh, pathophysiological event that's, that's hard to recapitulate in an in vitro system. I just want to show an image of our coherence anti stokes ram spectroscopy. This is basically label-free imaging. But what we have here, this is a tumour. The, the tumour cells are expressing GFP. All the other colours are just from the national Raman spectroscopy of, the, um, of the, the animal, the mouse. And if I run the movie, here we're looking at intravasation. I'm just going to stop there and show a couple of cells that are uh, intravasating into the, the tumour. Now, we can see the basement membrane. It's not so clear here. There's basement membrane here. So these cells are not breaking through the basement membrane. They're really protruding and invaginating into the blood vessels, uh, almost in, in, in an extreme way. And if you did pathology, you'd think these cells are already inside, but they're, they're not. So we, we get uh, unique insights into um, uh, intravasation. We can look at targets and compounds on that intravasation protrusion process. I'll just show another image. This is, uh, again, one image from a tumour, and these are uh, the boxes expanded. So we get lots of insight here. We can see the basement membrane. Here you can see a tumour cell uh, aligning along the basement membrane. And here you see that tumour cell. It looks like it's in the blood vessel, but it's not. It's surrounded by a basement membrane. And what we think is that basement membrane will break down. The tumour cells will be released into the bloodstream. They actually may even be encapsulated by the basement membrane as well. And this is something we're trying to get more quantitative data on. So with the CARS, we really get unique insights into elements of pathophysiology. And also, we're not just looking at tumour cells here. We're looking at the red blood cells, the endothelial cells, infiltrating inflammatory cells as well. So we can validate targets across different cell types in the, in the tumour. So I'm now going to just briefly talk about the protein microarray work. i um, not going to go into the technology. This technology has been around for many years now. I think the technique of antibody proteomics is advancing really because the antibodies are getting better rather than the technology. Uh, we do have a platform in Edinburgh called Zepsisins. It's a very sensitive platform for measuring proteins. Uh, we can literally measure hundreds of proteins in very small samples, such as a single well from a 96-well plate, or a little mig of tissue, or even a punched needle biopsy from a live animal model or a, a, a patient. And this is just an example of some of our compound profiling data. This is a compound. We profiled it across a dose response measured over 200 protein markers, including fossil epitopes. Uh, and we did this across a panel of four breast cancer cell lines. I'm just showing you one time point, three hours. We can take these measurements at multiple time points and get a very comprehensive view of uh, what that compound is doing at the pathway level, post-translational pathway level. This all looks like tartan to me, but if you focus in on one cell type, we can begin to see all the pathways that are dose-dependently changing, and you can see uh, some of the compensatory mechanisms. And by relating these dose-dependent changes over time, you really get a good idea of what's off-target activity, what's downstream feedback mechanisms and compensatory mechanisms. This particular compound, we know a lot about it it's, uh, in the clinic. Uh, it's a targeted drug. We know the target. So in this example, we're just learning more about the target, which we wouldn't see from biochemical screens. 
Uh, also, we can do the same approach in compounds coming from our phenotypic assay where we don't know anything about. And within two days, this, this experiment is very easy to do, we get a lot of information on mechanism and combination hypotheses uh, from our models. Uh, one of the values of this is it's very sensitive, so we can do it in our uh, tumour models, our PDX models. This is an example, again, using the example of a fat kinase inhibitor. This one's from GSK. We tested this inhibitor in our patient-derived ovarian PDX models, and we found some surprising PD markers, which we didn't expect uh, from this target. It also uh, helps us also get more from our models, also we get more information from the PDX model in this case, and we also get more uh, information from our in vitro models. We're very interested in drug combinations. We do lots of drug combination testing, and this is just an example of a dose matrix test across two colon cancer cell lines, TLD1 and HCT116. We have see a very strong combination. This is a particular combination in this cell, but it doesn't seem to work at all in the other cell. Uh, we don't understand it, but if you look at the mutation status of these two cells, it's very similar. But this is where we can use the RPPA again to monitor what's happening uh, in the monotherapy arms and the combination arms. Again, just quickly, in the DLD1 cell that's proficient, when we test with one of the drugs, we see all these compensatory mechanisms that are regulated, upregulated, and suppressed by the combination. In the HCT116 cells, we don't see that compensatory response at all. So for some reason, these cells are, are rewired at the post-translational level and we don't under, fully understand uh, that. But with, with, with the, this analysis, we can find, uh, uh, well, I guess we can use the models in a different way. Rather than using these models to predict patient outcome, we're using the models to further understand target biology, compound mechanism of action, and in this case, uh, the mechanism of action of a combination. So I'm just going to wrap up the talk now uh, by dis discussing what we're doing, drug discovery ourselves in Edinburgh. We have a chemistry group in the Edinburgh Cancer Research Centre led by Azure University Broquetta. And in that group, he's got two uh, very talented PhD students, which are in the, office, off, uh, in the audience. I'll, I'll laser them. Uh, but they've got uh, two posters here. Um, and Jason is uh, working on a very interesting pro-drug uh, pro project. He's developed a no novel pro-drug strategy where he uses palladium, a metal, uh, to convert pro-drug into activated drug. And the idea here is you'd insert the, the metal catalyst in the region of tissue and you get perpetual activation of uh, your prodrug in a local uh, region, such as a non-resectable tumour or even any other type of localised disease. I think the novel aspect, aspect here is, in addition to stents, is uh, it never run out. It's always perpetual activation. So a very elegant approach. And he's got a poster, uh, 105, so I encourage you to go and have a look at that. The other project we'll talk a little bit more about is uh, Craig Fraser's project, and here he's using something which we call ligand-based phenotypic screening. So this is a fairly simple approach. What we do is we design a, a chemical library based around a known ligand, and we expand that chemical library based on uh, diversity, biophysical properties, and novelty. And then we test that library very quickly across our phenotypic endpoints, and we'll rank performance across different phenotypic endpoints and use that information to guide the next stage of chemical design. So we do this very fast and quickly. We don't make any more than 20, 30 compounds at each stage. And we are, are, the chemical design is, is really independent of target. Uh, we're just taking phenotypic information, trying to look for some evidence of SAR and guide the next round of compounds. And what we're looking here is for increases in potency. And once we get our potency increased to a level that we get excited about, uh, we'll then triage the compounds. And we triage again very simply, put them into zebrafish, see if there's any toxic effects, some nice phenotypic endpoints we can measure in zebrafish as well. And also we'll do our RPPA to try and understand the mechanism of those uh, initial compounds. It's very useful for just weeding out the really non-specific, horrible-looking stuff. And if we do like the profiles that we see, we'll then uh, engage in our target deconvolution or target confirmation exercise. We don't always need to do target deconvolution. Obviously, when we look at these pharmacodynamic biomarkers, uh, we can convert these into probes and go straight into in vivo as well. Um, but we can do both routes. So this is just an example of the first library that we produced, that Craig produced. Uh, this library is based on an archetypical compound, uh, which is B. And the first library wasn't that exciting. There's somewhere activity around EC50, 48 micromolar to 17 micromolar. After four rounds of iteration in our phenotypic screens, we got to this compound which is sub-micromolar activity in our breast cancer cell lines. We deconvoluted the target by doing a biochemical screen. Um, we're pretty confident we know what the target is. Uh, there's also another compound that has its targets already in the clinic. This is A. 
Uh, we think our compound is more specific than the compound in the clinic and we still have a uh, greater potency. Uh, we confirmed the target mechanism by having some uh, knockout cells and we lose activity, whereas again the clinical candidate is still a bit more potent indicating it's a bit less specific. Uh, now, the, uh, Craig's also uh, done the ADME profiling studies. The data is on the poster if anybody wants to have a look at, at these compounds. Uh, but again, the take-home message here is with very limited resources, basically Craig does all the chemical uh, uh, synthesis and the screening with a bit of help. Um, and uh, with, in under three years, we've got some very interesting compounds. So I think it's a very cost-effective strategy for developing tool compounds, but also preclinical candidates. Uh, this seems to work for us. So I'm just going to finish the last slide with a bit of unashamed promotion. So everything you've seen has been done in the Cancer Centre. We're just setting up a new lab now called Edinburgh Phenotypic Acid Development Centre. It's going to be located in the Queen's Medical Research Institute, which is uh, at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. This is another hospital in Edinburgh. And here we really want to expand our activities across disease area. There's 600 clinical researchers that work at this site. And right next door, we have the Scottish Centre for Regenerative Medicine, another 250 researchers working in stem cell technologies. So I think we have huge uh, access here to novel assays and novel diseases. Uh, we also work closely with the School of Informatics in Edinburgh uh, to help us support with image informatics approaches. And as well as testing compounds in these novel assays, uh, we're also very interested in target validation, of course, and we're working with other uh, researchers in Edinburgh that have interesting technologies and interest in synthetic biology. Uh, to look at non-coating amino acids and, uh, again, do some target validation. So this activity, really the aim here is to get novel mechanistic assays that relate to disease. We'll use these for our own drug discovery. We'll work with pharma. But we're also supporting this uh, new exciting initiative called the UK National Phenotypic Screening Centre. Paul Andrews talked about this uh, yesterday, and there's a, there's a table in the innovation zone and a poster. So if anyone's interested, I encourage you to uh, have a look or come and speak to us. The real aim of this is really to um, promote advancement and expansion of phenotypic screening. And our role here is to deliver really novel mechanistic assays relevant to disease uh, to help support this screening at a larger scale than what we do ourselves. So I'm just going to finish there. I would like to thank all the people that have been involved in this work and also our funders and supporters. And thank you for your attention.